coming up on Man Enough. On the outside, y'all can see he doing this movie. He got that award. Bop, bop, bop. But in the, in, at the end of the day, like, I know what my, what's going on in my life. And I could, I'll could, i be completely honest with you. I have not been showing up for my life for the last two years. Thank you for sharing that with us. In some ways, I am there right now in my own way. As men, we grow up feeling alone. We feel like we're the only ones experiencing this feeling. that Nobody else is experiencing it because everybody else is fucking hiding it, pretending like they got their shit together. It's been hard now making amends with myself and really, like, taking inventory of, like, yo, like, what was all the shit that you did, bro? Being man enough, what does that mean? It's really manly to mess up, admit you're wrong, and then grow. I couldn't accept that I was evil, so maybe I'm broken, but those broken things could be corrected. Intimacy between a father and a son is me just wanting to like put my head in your lap. I love you, son. You haven't called me a benevolent sexist, but my experience is women are better. Even if it's a positive, it's still not equality. I don't blame men for that. I just blame the system. This is Man Enough. Hey, welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. If this is your first time here, we're having a fun day. You know how sometimes everything goes smoothly. And then sometimes you're not on set. And Liz is on set. And we're all <laughs> a special guest who's not on set. But you are going to experience firsthand what it's like to just wing it, right? So, um, but I promise you it's going to be worth it. Before we get into it, Liz, what's going on over there? We are, yeah, I'm in studio in LA. You're in Jersey. We, we've switched coasts. Um, so I'm taking care of, of the West Coast for you. And you're taking care of the East Coast for me. And I feel... Um, Happy that you're there holding the fort down and uh, things are good. <laughs> you know, it's sweet because we are in a space that we get to talk about some elevated concepts and talk about things that have to do with masculinity and how it affects all of humanity. Me as a man, how can I be better? What am I doing right? How do we see things a little bit um, with better eyes, right? And the way, one of the ways we do that is to communicate and to have special guests on. And I'm excited that we, that we get to do this all the time. Me too. <laughs> I'm so excited. And we have such a, an amazing guest today that we've been trying to get for a long time. Schedules have finally aligned. Anthony Ramos is an actor. Say that, say that name again. Who? Anthony Ramos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you've on. heard of him, I loved him in Hamilton. I was lucky enough to, to see him a few times, actually. He also was in A Star is Born. He was in The Heights, which I also loved. And he basically is, is extremely, in addition to being an incredible actor, is also very committed to representation of Latin American stories and voices in the entertainment industry, something that's very important to us too. So you can see him most recently in Transformers, Rise of the Beasts. Welcome, Anthony, to our show. What's up? What's up? I'm so happy to well, be here. First, I have to say, Anthony, do you remember that we've met before? Wait, where with me? Don't go. Okay. You, she put me on the spot. The first I know, I'm thing, doing it. the first <laughs> question. I thought That's it was going to be. No, no, no. You know what? I, I got set up just now. I thought the first question was going to be like, yo, you know, we like to start off all our guests with the first question. What does it mean to be man enough? Oh, we have. Right? You're a real listener of the show. You know the first question. I'm a fan. But but uh, but no, I don't remember the. I feel I'm regretfully. I don't. Know no, the I mean I you. At, so. It would be weird if you did. It was, I want to say, New Year's Eve, 2016, Bruno Mars concert. Las I was about Vegas, to be like, what party? Is this Vegas? Vegas. In a limo. We shared a limo and took Yo, tequila shots we were... in the limo with Trayvon. Da I, David Corrins is my, was my boyfriend at the time. And I right. uh, worked on Hamilton David. with you. So, yes. And we all went to the hotel room. Yes, see the, the fireworks and all that. We were in Trayvon's room and we yeah, all saw the fireworks from his balcony. Yo, that's Yeah, exactly. Crazy. There we go. And I was a huge fan of yours then and have loved seeing you reach new heights, uh, no pun intended, and, and just, yeah, uh, be such a huge voice also on so many important issues and talk about, you know, you talk about masculinity so much in, in so many of your interviews and really sort of go out of your way to... to yeah, bring awareness to these to, to, to these concepts. And so we're so happy to to share this time with you. And and I don't have I don't have a story that goes back to 2016, but I do have to <laughs> share something with you. Yeah. So I have a I have a weird relationship with you. Let me tell you why. Because if you happen to pop on my television, or if the house is playing the music, then my wife drops everything she's doing. 
<laughs> including the kids, and runs over. Everything, I mean, she sits in front of the TV like this. I mean, it's like, this. it's Aww. like, uh, <laughs> and we've talked about having you on the podcast before. Every time she's like, um, you make sure I'm there for that, right? You make, <laughs> you make sure I'm there for that. So um, she has no idea, but he, I, I have to do something because yeah. if not. Oh, I love it. I love it. Let's go. Let's go. What's her name? Die. Natasha. Natasha. Hello. Yo, yo, Natasha, how you doing? <laughs> no, you didn't. I'm so mad at my husband right now. What's oh up? <laughs> how you doing? How, how are you? I'm good. I'm geeking out. <laughs> it's, you know, it's good to meet you, man. It's good to meet you. I'm I'm uh, I'm about to be here and your husband's going to ask me all the hardest questions I've ever been asked in my whole life. So I'm, I'm going to need you to say a prayer for me. Yeah, he's going to make you real uncomfortable. <laughs> Just like I did you, baby. Just like I did you right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's great to meet you, yo. Thank you. Thank you for, for the love, man. I love you, baby. <laughs> oh, you owe me. You owe me big time. <laughs> I love you. That's baby. marriage. That's marriage. You owe I love it. Thanks, brother. I, I, I appreciate you taking a minute to say hello. Um, of course, man. Of course. So, yes, sorry to hijack it, because really we, what we do want to get in and talk about um, some real stuff. So, um, you know, we normally don't start off with the question you thought we start off. We start off with this one, which is when is the last time that you didn't feel enough? Oh, right, right, right. That's the one. Yeah, I messed up the question. But, yeah, that was the one I was thinking <laughs> in my heart. <laughs> Uh, was the last time I didn't feel enough? Whoa. I mean, just yesterday, I had a mad therapy session. Uh, I was talking to my therapist. She, she literally said after the session, she said, yo, uh, you know, don't be surprised if you're a little tired because we've, uh, we've, we've, um, we, ha we handled a lot. We, we talked about a lot today. So, and I guess in, in, like as we were doing it, it didn't feel like it was a lot. But when she said that, I guess it hit me. I was like, "Yo, it's either this is like reverse psychology, and she tricked me into making me believe that we had a deep ass conversation when it wasn't actually <laughs> as, as deep." But it was. <laughs> but I was like, "But I think it was super deep." Like, yeah, and I was, I was tired. I took a nap after. I was like, uh, "It took." I, you know, we talked about a a moment in my childhood that um, that I think is deeply rooted in my behavior. Uh, now in my life mm. you know you know she, can you she, share like, Do, or if yeah. it's not if it's not um too, pri too private no nah, she said yeah hey, let me see if i got notes you always want to be in control like usually she said to me she said you know you try to avoid feeling anxious powerless and full of fear she said you're trying to control uh oh, I, I, I was typing so fast it's a typo i said you're trying to control the city's tune by not letting <laughs> yourself be alone i don't know what the city's tune is but you're trying yeah. to basically control everything by not letting yourself be alone. You know, it's, uh, mm. and then, and then I put in parentheses, I'm not good enough. I literally wrote that yesterday. Um, mm. and, uh, and then I wrote underneath that, don't say it if you don't believe it. Oh, that was a separate note, basically like saying like, don't say something to somebody if you don't believe it. That was, that was something that came to my mind as I was talking to her, but, but. So you said, yeah. you said, I, you said, I don't feel good enough. A hundred percent. I what yeah, was that and about? I put that in parentheses. It was just about um, you know, since I was a kid, I, um, you know, I've had a problem in my in my family. You know, my family we we struggled. It was big as a family, just with substance abuse. You know, drugs, alcohol. Specifically with my dad, I always tried to stay out of the way or not get him upset because I said, and I find myself doing that as an adult, like. Because as a kid, I was like, I'm, I must, I definitely must be the problem. Like if he ain't around and he's not coming around or I'm making him mad, I keep making him upset or I keep doing things to make him mad. Right. So, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm a, I'm problematic in his life, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I felt that way for my mom too. You know, I was like, you know, if she didn't have us, she maybe, maybe, you know, she'd have less stress in her life. So I think there was something instinctually that was like, the sooner I can get out of the house, 
the easier I can make her life. And maybe the easier I can make mine because then I won't have to be around her when she's stressed and then I'll make me less anxious. You know, so um, I moved out, you know, when I was 13 and I went to live with my aunt. But I lived with my aunt and then she kicked me out. She, she asked me to leave nicely. She didn't kick me out, but she asked me to leave when I was 16. And, you know, theoretically, I was supposed to move back in with my mom, but I just didn't want to move back in there. Um, I just didn't want to move back in because I just felt like it was a step backwards, not because it was not because of my mom, but just because of me going back to where I started. It just felt like oh, I'm going back, like I'm, I'm going backwards. So I just kind of I had like an itinerary. I would stay over at different friends' houses and I'd go, you know, I had like a like a, a map in my head. I'm like, yo, on Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm staying at Jason's house. On 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 Thursday and Friday, I'm staying with Luciano. I'm staying with Titi Emily, even though she kicked me out. She could at least let me stay there for one day a week. So I'll be like, I'll go stay with her on a Saturday, then I'll go stay with my mom one day, and mm-hmm. then I'll just start over, you know? And I was doing that every week. I had clothes in people's different and different. I was borrowing clothes from people, you know, shit like that. Like, you know, I was like a nomad, you know, as a kid. So I think, you know, that feeling of not feeling good enough, I just never wanted to be a problem, you know. But I think in 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 feeling like you're always the problem, it's hard for you to identify the real problems in your own life. And it's hard, you know, because everything you just blame it on yourself. Well, oh, well, I messed up, so let me get out of this relationship. Or I'm not, you know, I'm not good enough, so I don't want to mess you up. And things like that. When really sometimes it's just that, you know, maybe your ideals or whatever don't align with that person. Or maybe that thing actually doesn't make you feel good or doesn't make you feel your best. But because you always feel like mm-hmm. at the bottom of the barrel, you're like, well, I'm not, I'm not worthy enough to feel like that thing might not be right for me. It's always, I'm not right for that person or I'm mm-hmm. not right for that thing or I'm not right. You know what I'm saying? So I just kind of like, yo, if I could just stay out the way and not be a problem, mm. you know, that's, it's all good. I ain't even trying to cause a problem. I don't want to, you know, I just want to be a ghost, mm. you know? So, um, but yeah, that was kind of like where that conversation, that conversation sparked, you know, it, it was, um, it came from a, a, a thing that happened with me and my father when I was a kid. Um, that, uh, you know, in that moment, mm-hmm. you know, where he kind of left and I was just like, damn, bro, like, you know, we can't, we can't swear on the show, right? Sure you can. Sure can. I was like, yo, what the fuck did I do? Mm-hmm. Like, damn. You know, I was like 10. And, um, yeah, but he, you know, he, but I, you know, I, we have a good relationship now, so I try not to, I try not to, because he listens to these things too, so I try not to bring up the things that he did yeah, sure. So that I remind you know, I don't want to remind him of that shit because he already knows what you know. He already knows, but you know, and we you know we cool Has now. Has he so. apologized? Like, what was that healing like between you and your dad in order to rebuild that relationship? He's a he's apologized. Yeah, you know, many times, so many times that I'm like, you know, I told him I was like, bro, like, like it's all right. You know, you don't have to make up for anything. You don't have to. You know, there's there's nothing you can do, you know, now, mm-hmm. but just be there. You know, you don't have to do anything extra. The best thing you could actually do for me is, is you know, be do what's best for you in your own life. You know, really, mm-hmm. like, take care of yourself. Take mm-hmm. care of your health and, and take care of your mental health. But that, that process has been, um, it's been over the course of years. You know, I, I didn't realize how, um, how much it's affected me deeply, you know, um, until, yeah, until like recently I started doing therapy like three years ago. You know I mean? I've always been, you know, I've always had faith and, you know, I grew up in church and I'm a Christian and, you know, I was taught to pray and, you know, read my word and stuff. But, you know, I think sometimes it also, it's also helpful when you, you have a person who is studying the human brain, you know, or like, you know, and, and behavior and, who can kind of break it down to you in, in a mm. in a practical way. Um, but mm. yeah, no, I think I think we've we've begun to um we're still healing, you know, it's every, you know, it's 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 daily. It's a process all the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with neglect, right, or or any kind of um with, like when your needs aren't met as a child, you become extremely attuned to other people's needs. And right, because in order for your needs to be met, you 
understand what needs need to be met for your parent, right? It, it's literally a, a survival mechanism, right? And so the fact yeah. that you, and, and there's no choice but to internalize um, your caregiver's b behaviors, right? So when a child doesn't feel, um, you know, love from his parents or is, you know, their, their needs aren't met. They don't stop loving the parent. They stop loving themselves. And yeah. again, that internalization of it, it, it's my fault, right? Instead of seeing the parent as separate and what they're doing as, as separate, which with our adult brains, we're able to do the, the, the child brain ca cannot separate, uh, right? The parent is almost like an extension of you. So if they're mistreating you, if they're neglecting you, then it must be something that you have done. And I think that that can take so long to unlearn. And, and so I'm, I'm curious with your adult brain, right? Like, you know, now that you didn't cause your uh, parents' behaviors, right? That they were shaped by their own parents and their own environments. Do you still think that you were the problem? Like, do, have you been able to reframe that experience for you to understand that like your father didn't leave because of you? Um, and, and that there was, yeah, that it wasn't your fault. Do, do you believe it wasn't your fault? Yeah, I, I believe it. I think it's still a process to believe it, though. I don't know if I believe it 100 percent, but yeah, I was we, it was I was in a group and people were kind of sharing, sharing stories recently. And and this one woman said she said, you know. I used to blame people all the time for all the things they weren't giving me, or, you know, because my parents mm -hmm. weren't treating me a, a certain type of way or. I want what's owed to me. Like I want what's, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, yeah, you know, I deserve to be treated this way. And, you know, mm -hmm. like they owe me kind of thing. And, and that someone has said to her, you know, and, and said something to her that made her, her switch. her thinking. basically, she, they was like, how sad, how sad it is that your parent couldn't treat you the way they wanted to. Exactly. Yeah. How sad it is that your parent couldn't, you know, be, the parent that they wanted to be to you. Yeah. And I was like, dang, like, you know, maybe, you know, just because they don't do, just because they don't do something doesn't mean that they don't want to do it. That's maybe right. Maybe they can't, or maybe they don't know how to do it. Yeah. That's right. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, you can't blame them. It's just like, you know, maybe you want somebody to love you a certain way, but that's just not in their capacity. Yeah. Or maybe somebody wants you to love them a certain way, but you just, mm -hmm. that's not, it's not in you and you, Mm -hmm. You know, and then as you know, me being the person that can't love them the way I want to, I start to beat myself up. Yeah. Because I'm like, yo, that's not in me. And there's an expectation of me that I can't meet. I don't mm -hmm. know how to express that. So now I just lash out or I'm mad or I, you know what I'm saying? And I can't really, mm -hmm. I can't really just articulate, yo, that's not something I can do right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, man, you know, I, I, there's something, check, just check this out really quickly. What's up? Yo, what's good, bro? <laughs> Anthony! What's up, my man? Yo, it's good to oh. see you, bro. Oh, so good to see you. Hi, Liz. Justin, your hair is so short. Yeah, oh, no. yeah, you haven't seen a cut. Oh, my God. It's, it's I love it. Anthony, oh, man. I just, I sent you a text a little bit ago. I just wanted to make sure you got it, but I'm so grateful that you're doing the show with us. For, oh, yeah. for just so everyone knows, I think Anthony is one of the most talented actors working in hollywood today and i'm yeah. so damn excited for him to take over the industry yeah like Man, thank you bro yes you have you're just your heart and your soul shines through everything that you do and i'm just such a huge fan and you sent me uh we don't have to talk about it but he sent me a new song that he's working on oh yeah Oof. yeah I'm which is really in line if you think about it anthony it's really in line with what we're doing here on the show yeah, dude. I mean, like, that's why I sent it to you, cause, cause, I, you know, I was like, dang, this really reminds me of, um, of what y'all doing on the on on the show, you know. And going back to um, realizing that that you know, you the love for somebody, you can't love somebody the way you thought they that you could, and and they can't love you the way that you feel like, you know, what I'm saying like the the like y'all y'all ain't meshing anymore, right? The way you started is not really the way you are now. And, and and it just, I basically went through a, a breakup, you know, uh, I, maybe over a year and a half ago now, something like that. And I was about to get married and everything. It was wild. Oh, wow. And it was bugged out. Like wedding was planned. A house was basically bought. Like it was bugged wow. out. 
the relationship was kind of semi-public a little bit. You know, we tried to break up on the low. We couldn't. The, you know, <laughs> people, I, you know, they're like, what is he doing? He's cheating on his girl outside with this girl. Yeah. But, you know, I met this girl, right, you know, after and, and uh, you know, she was she was there for me after my breakup. She was there for me, but I just couldn't. She wanted more than I could give in that moment. I was so broken from, you know, my my, you know, that breakup because I was with, you know, I was with this girl for, you know, almost seven years. Mm. So it was wild. Like, you know, we it was it was deep, you know, but um, but I, I just I knew that I knew I needed some time alone. You know, I, I needed to find myself. You know, and, um, you know, it's cliche, but it it, it really is. It, it really is the truth. You know, like I had my season where I was wild, like crazy. I mean, I, I'm talking about that season just ended like last week. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like kind of thing. And and I think I was doing that because I just didn't want to face the truths of like, mm. you know, it's very easy for you to say, oh, it's this person's fault or this person wasn't doing this or, and this is mm-hmm. this is why I felt that way but it was like but but aunt like forget about anything you forget about any of the stuff you think that this person did to you that was wrong and only focus on the shit that you did wrong that's right that's right like literally and that's been hard you know it's been hard now making amends with myself and you know and really like taking inventory of like yo like what was all the shit that you did, bro? You know, what, what, what were the times when, when you, when you were at your best, when you didn't, you, you couldn't love, when you lied, when you did that, when whatever, right? Like what was all, take track of all of that shit and try to start dealing with it one by one. Don't look at the list. Cause then you're going to get overwhelmed and you're going to get sad and you, you know, you can't deal with nothing, but if you just start dealing with it one by one, then you can start checking it off little by little, but basically how that song came about, I wrote the song called When a Man Cries, cause you know, I'm hanging with this, you know, I'm hanging with this girl and, and again, like we vibe and we, you know, and, and she's amazing and everything inside of me wants to be like, oh great. Like, I, you know, I, 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 I feel like I can love again, but the cycle in me that has gone from relationship to relationship and not allowed myself to breathe, that part of me was like, yo bro, you're doing the same thing you've been doing your whole life, you've been doing this shit and it has not worked. And you are jumping from relationship to relationship to avoid dealing with yourself. You really yes. are. Like you're never gonna find yourself in any of these women. You're not, you know, mm. and, and and it's very hard to believe, especially when you're dealing with abandonment issues and you're dealing with a parent that left, shit like that. Cause you just want someone there. You wanna feel like there's somebody there. So when they are not there, it's like I'm alone, and then you you almost feel like it's like okay, well, what do I do? What do I do now that I'm alone? You know, mm-hmm. and and the only way you learn how to be alone is to be alone. Yes. And you know, I, I was with this girl, and I knew, like, I was saying goodbye to her. I was like, yo, this feels different. This goodbye feels different. This doesn't feel like see you later. This feels like goodbye. Maybe not goodbye, like I'll never see you again, but this feels like goodbye to this thing that we have right now. Like it's never gonna be the same because I think I know that I really, really, truly have to deal with myself right now, and and it hurts because I know that that doesn't include the type of relationship that I wish we could have and that I know you want and that I want, but I know I can't have right now. And um, I basically wrote this song called "When a Man Cries" because I'm like in her arms, I'm crying in this girl's arms. I'm like, yo, why am I bawling like this? Like what, like, why am I crying so hard? And she's just like, just consoling me. She's just holding me and I'm just bawling in her arms. And, you know, she left, I went to, or I left, went to the airport, I can't even remember. Months later, I'm in the studio and I start thinking about that scenario. And I'm talking about, I stayed up till six in the morning writing this song. And I don't know why it was the last song that I wrote on this writing trip out here in Miami. I was just in the studio. It was my last day in the studio. And, and I just remember like, it's like, and I wrote this, this, this song. It's like, it's like, I have to go, but I don't want to leave. Cause I don't know uh, if it's the last time I'll see that pretty face in those blue eyes and the way that I love how they stare right back in my greens and how they see the man that I could be. 
Now all the messages you left are at the bottom of the bottle of the whiskey by my bed. So I keep stepping on the throttle and I grab another bottle because it's me who's empty instead. Why does it feel like I could die? Why, oh, why? Every time we say goodbye, my, oh, my. The sharpest pain in my chest, suffocating out of breath, cutting through like a knife. Is this really what it's like? My, oh, my, when a man cries. Mm. You know, and then it's like, you know, I've never been to heaven, but I know I've seen before. An angel, but in human form. You used to hang your wings and leave your sneakers by the door. You know, there was this thing where she knew that I was unsure. So her behavior was also unsure, too, because she couldn't let me in as much as she wanted to. Right. So she used to hang your wings. You know, that was like, you know, she was an angel. She hang her wings. But then she always leave her sneakers by the door because she was leaving. (laughs) That was like her way of telling me, like, I'm leaving. I'm not staying here, bro. She used to hang your wings and leave your sneakers by the door. Not anymore. You would leave me before daylight till you trust me enough to stay the night. But you never did anything wrong. Now all the times you didn't tell me that you love me, now I understand you were just scared. I know I've dealt with pain before, but this is different and it's more and nothing else can compare. Why does it feel like I could die? Why, oh, why? Every time we say goodbye. The sharpest pain in my chest, because it was crazy, the crazy pain I had in my chest. Sharpest mm. pain in my chest, suffocating out of breath, cutting through like a knife. Is this really what, it, what it's like when a man cries? And then it's like, I have to go, but I don't want to leave because I don't know when's the next time I'll see the one I know is the girl of my dreams. I'm traveling with a suitcase full of tragedy because it feels like I could die. You know, why, why, every time, you know, every time I say goodbye. But it was just like, I couldn't comprehend like why I was crying so hard. I hadn't cried like that in years. Anthony, that's what I wanted to ask you. So if you think about it, really only us men could create an entire song about us crying because it's an event. Right. Like, right. right. It's an event. Can you imagine like a, like, let's just be real. Like a woman creating a song about that time she cried. It's like, no, if I asked Liz when the last time she cried was, I'm going to guess in the last 48 hours or am I wrong? Oh, 24. Right. 24. I, I was, I was being generous, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so, so Anthony, I'm curious. And by the way, thanks for letting me crash uh, the party. Oh, hey, man. Um, thanks. Oh, great. Going, I got, so got hundred people in the other room that are like, where are you? We got to yeah, make yeah, a movie. You, you, um, sorry, but but I got Anthony Ramos here and I got to talk. I know it. <laughs> Why do you think it is that it becomes an event? Like for us men, when we have those moments where we're crying in somebody's arms or we feel that pain in our chest, it's like burned into our cellular memory. It's an event because we don't allow ourselves to cry. What is it for you? Like, what is it inside you? Because I, I know so many men in America can relate to you. Of like, what stopped you from allowing yourself to cry over the course of your life? And are you doing anything now so that you can more freely cry when stuff comes up? I think what stopped me was I started to feel like a little cold. You know, I think resentment. Right. And a little bit of that, and uh, a little bit of like, you know, it was almost like it was, uh, I don't even, it might sound crazy, but like, I was like, I don't need to, what am I, I don't need to cry for what? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I can just move on. I don't have to cry, like cry about what? You know, and, and even though I may have felt like I wanted to, there was almost this block that I put on myself mm-hmm. um, because I was like, Cause I kept telling myself, you don't have to cry. There's nothing to cry about. I kept saying to myself, there's nothing to cry about. Even though I knew that I wanted to cry and I, because I couldn't understand why I was crying. Then I would just say, there's nothing to cry about. Is this even when you were younger? Like going all the way back? Nah, you know, it's when I was younger, I, I, you know, I actually cried as a kid a lot. I was very emotional. Right. And then and then something happened, like, especially toward my, my teenage years, but then especially going into college where um, where I was just getting cold. And then I think, to, and then and then probably in the middle of my relationship as well, like, you know, my last relationship, I was very, you know, I think we started to grow apart and I started to grow, get resentful about that. So I think my disposition, instead of me crying, or getting kind of emotional about it, I was very like hard and blocked. Mm. Mm. And I was very like, it's all right, whatever. 
If we're not going to talk about it, then whatever. If we're not going to deal with this, then whatever. Mm. And I started. Is that your coping mechanism? Is that what you go to when you feel any kind of you block? Is that your how you? One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Especially when you feel like you communicating with somebody, but y'all ain't getting nowhere. So so instead of me trying to do the work to try to try to get there, okay, well this this is not working. So maybe we could try this. Oh, this is not working. So maybe we could try this. You know, we try one 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 or two times, and if it ain't getting through, then it's like, all right, whatever. That. Mm. So I guess you don't care enough, which which is selfish of me to say that you don't care enough. Maybe that maybe just the way I'm communicating with this person is not getting through, or the way you know what I'm saying. But quickly mm-hmm. I'll go to you don't care, which is an old feeling for you. That's probably that's is, which, I missed the first part, but I'm assuming that's little Anthony who didn't yeah, right. feel like somebody listened to his feelings mm-hmm. or cared for him. And, that's yeah. when he shows up, right? Yeah. It's even, you know, it's even hard. It's hard for me to open up to my dad and my mom because I think there's, you know, parts of me that still say, you know, you don't care, even though they do. They do care. Mm-hmm. They they care in, in the way that they know how, you know, especially my mom. But, you know, like she cares, but she's just, you know, I don't give her the chance, you know, because it's a habit that I've, it's become a habit. Like it's literally, I have to unlearn this shit now. Yeah. At 32 years old, I'm trying to unlearn how to not, how to um, give someone a chance, you know, to give them the benefit of the doubt. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't not communicate with someone because you automatically think that they don't care. Mm. Just because they're not communicating or they're not reciprocating in the way that you would like. You know what I'm saying? They're they not giving you the advice or the kind of feedback you would like. So automatically you think, ah, they don't care. It's kind of crazy. Like, I created this whole story in my mind which has been bad in relationships with friends and girlfriends. And it's just, it's, you know, where now I'm like, yo, like you you have to give people a chance. Mm -hmm. You have to give yourself a chance too. going out, staying out late. Like that shit is a coping mechanism for me. Cause it's just like the more noise I can create, the more hours pass. And then I can just go straight to my bed and go to sleep and then get up and leave Mm -hmm. and go about my day. The next day, go do whatever my routine and go do what I got to do you know, and then do the same shit. I think you're touching on something really important that we haven't really talked a lot about on this podcast. You know, me personally, I learned that I had a really hard time being alone and being still. So for me, the idea of doing nothing was so scary for me, was so scary for like the little Justin inside of me that I had to fill my time. I had to overcompensate. I had to create, I had to create, I had to create. I was running from the fear of what would come up when I was alone. Because when I was alone, if I had to be alone with myself, then I had to actually think and process. So even when I was alone, where would I go? I'd go to social media. I would go to porn. I would go to anything I could possibly go to distract me. When in reality, the one thing I needed more than anything was to be alone and learn how to connect with myself. Because I have this belief that all of these addictions, all of these things that we do, all of all of our coping mechanisms come from a deep desire to connect, not just with other people, but to ourselves. Because there's a part of ourselves that wasn't heard, wasn't listened to, wasn't loved. So what you're touching on right now is really important, whether it's going through a breakup and, and, and really taking account, like you said, of how you were in the relationship, which let's be real, a lot of us men don't do. A lot of us men don't do that when we leave a relationship. That's why the next relationship ends the way the one did before. Right. You know what? When a man gets married three times, sorry, your present company <laughs> excluded. Generally, if they haven't done the work, the third marriage ends the same way the previous two did. Oh yeah, right. You are you are an anomaly in that sense because you've really done the work. But generally, that's what happens because we don't know how to be alone. We don't know how to sit with our feelings. So, what do you say, Anthony, to all the men that are out there listening who? have maybe come from a bad breakup and maybe they're in that cycle of losing themselves with alcohol, with porn, going out on, you know, I believe there's a whole addiction to simply swiping and then dating on Tinder and these apps. They're just like, like how many people can help me forget about the last one or how many people can I be with that can just numb the part of me that doesn't know or doesn't want to feel? What do you say to all those men and what what are you doing differently now? Because it seems like you're actually 
sitting with yourself. You, you write that song. You're, you're putting it into art. I mean, I want to say to any, you know, men who feel like they can't be still and, and sit alone and deal with themselves that I'm going through that journey with you. It's not like I've been doing this shit for years. <laughs> like, <laughs> I ain't an expert, you know? Like, I'm, I'm struggling like you. The, yeah, there's porn, there's, you know, girl, a, a random girl, like you just chilling and there's nothing going on. And you're like, okay, today I'm going to be by myself. And then a girl hits you up and you're like, ah, <laughs> you know, like, well, these I don't are, know. I mean, it's these, always... are, these are Anthony Ramos problems. That's I was going to say. No, 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 no. But, but seriously, it's like, it's like in the moments where you about like, where you literally are like, like it takes discipline for us to be like, yeah. in the moments where we, our, it always ha- look like, and again, like uh, you know, like I shared before, like you know, in uh, uh in, in Christianity, we believe that it's like when you know when God is moving you to a new season, that's when the enemy attacks the hardest. Yes, it's yes, in those sir. moments when 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 you by yourself, you know what I'm saying, or you like you now you dating somebody, you talking to somebody, and then boom, it's those three girls that haven't hit you in forever. They all of a sudden, hey, thinking about you, but like. <laughs> But but the part but the part of you the the carnal part in us is like oh I right, bet yeah you want and you want to entertain it but it's 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 taking it's like it's like remembering you know I I think you know it's funny I was, I was I sat with my pastor the other day for dinner and we've been texting each other this thing called hashtag on mission I've been continuing to say to myself like yo what's the mission mm-hmm. what's the mission. Is this gonna throw me off the mission? You know, and again, like I'm only months into this shit. I'm not like I ain't been doing this for years. Like I'm months into trying to be like into actually being like, all right, cool, let's let's get let's get aligned, let's get going, let's let's get on mission, let's like get focused, you know. So there's still, you know, it's 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 you know, I'm a baby in this shit right now. Mm. You know, but, but, but I'm, ex- you know, I think that w- what's encouraging is that, you know, like when you a baby, you get excited about everything. You want to touch everything. Wonder. And then every time, every little victory, every time you don't answer that message or every time you don't go out, you know, cause sometimes you might, you might fuck up and you might or not, not even fuck up, but you might be like, oh, I'm gonna answer that message. Oh, I'm gonna go out. But every time you don't do it, that's a victory. That's a small victory. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the more small victories you could rack. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? By the time a year goes by, you're looking at your record, that shit look pretty good. Mm. And you're like, all right, bet. Let me see how many small victories I could keep racking. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Baseball players play 162 games a year. These motherfuckers, they not winning every game. You know, but if you can keep just going out, you know, you keep going out on the field and you keep giving yourself a chance, you know, like, you know, it's just, it's, it's you know, it's been hard, but like, you know, trying to, you know, trying to extract habits, like, yo, I'm not going to drink at all. I'm going to drink less. So I'm like, I'm not, you know, I'm going to take this out, right? I'm not going to party as much as I used to. I'm not, because there's just shit going on that I need to show up for life. I don't mean to, you know, come on here and preach and shit, but. Please preach. I just, just, I feel passionate about this shit because of what I've been going through, man. I Like, I've experienced so much pain and just in life in general, but especially the last two years, you know, and it's been so much good that's come from it. You know what I'm saying? Some pain I've inflicted and some pain that's been inflicted on me. How can I use this to be, uh, to, to, to keep me move? How, how am I going to learn from, from all of this? And also like, I want to show up for life. What, what are the things that are keeping me from actually showing up from the, you know, showing up, they keeping me from showing up for, for my life, the life that I want to live. Cause yeah. I could on the outside, y'all could see he doing this movie, he got that award, pop, pop, pop. But in the in, at the end of the day, like I know what my what's going on in my life, and I could mm-hmm. I'll be completely honest with you, I have not been showing up for my life for the last two years. I'll be a hundred percent keep it a thousand on man enough. I have not been showing up for my life. Preach, baby. That. Going out, trying to just deal with my problems. Whether it's a, a girl or a drink or a, a staying out till five in the morning, wondering like why why I could have went home three four hours ago, mm. I could have went home five hours ago. I could have been in bed by midnight, gotten up at eight, do my thing. You know, I could have had energy to work out. I'm not doing this shit because I'm just I'm just trying to prolong the even or prolong whatever experience is helping me escape from the fucking shit that I really need to be dealing with. Yes, you know what I'm saying. Mm. And it's like. 
that's kind of like the the process I'm on, you know, and it's hard. So it's hard. I was in my crib by myself all day yesterday. All day I was just in the crib. Somebody hits me up, yo, what are you doing? Da da da. Another friend hits me. And I'm just like, no, I'm not gonna go out today. I'm not gonna leave this crib. I'm gonna stay in here. I'm gonna stay here with my dog and I'm gonna talk to him and act like this motherfucker talks back. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know what, Anthony? What 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 I love that you're doing right now is you're demonstrating to uh, to all of us, yeah, the process, which is you don't have all the answers. You're not pretending to have all the answers or that you've arrived. Mm -hmm. You're acknowledging mm -hmm. that you're on the tracks right now. You're falling off. You're getting back on, and this whole thing. But one thing that I hear you saying, like when you started with to focus on the stuff that you can do better rather than the things that other people aren't doing right. When you say right. things like that, which means is you're holding yourself accountable. And when we finally do that, when you finally look at yourself, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be with judgment. It's not to like bury yourself and walk with shame, but to look at yourself authentically and say, I am not showing up for myself. Therefore, I'm not showing up for the world in the way that I know my purpose was designed to show up. Right. Not that your art and all these other things are not part of that. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're not going to be buried with the awards you got. You're going to be buried with what you've done for humanity. And you right now are demonstrating to all of us really so that, important that it's like okay and and in fact you're not you don't look weak because you're talking you're about strong. it you look stu super super strong man you're showing to other men like oh i can admit that i, I got flaws and that i i've been hiding under the bed or whatever that means uh dude i'm really proud of you especially man especially because you are in the position you're in i'm going to share something real yeah. quick and with you that that cuz i know where you are and in some ways I am there right now in my own way. Um, and I was talking to my therapist the other day and I, Liz, I think you'll like this too. Um, because I have an issue when I act out or when I distract, I beat the shit out of myself. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. then creates the spiral, right? So you're doing, you're, you're engaging in behavior that you're, because you're avoiding. And then when you engage, engage in that behavior and you're up all night or you're doing something and you got to wake up and whatever you got to do the next day, you then go into this like, why did I do that? And I'm bad and I'm shameful. And then it just repeats the pattern. And she said to me that human beings are like globes. And she said when the sun shines and for, you know, for me and Jamie as Baha'is, we, we think about the sun as God, right? The sun is God shining its light on us. When the sun shines on a globe, it never hits the entire globe. It only hits a piece of it. And on the other side of the globe is the shadow, is the darkness. We as human beings, as spiritual beings having this human experience, we need the darkness. We need the darkness because it is through the darkness that we can find the light. And eventually we just have to wait and look for the light. But we're always both things. So when I think about like, oh, my flaws or the shit that I did wrong or the avoidance or whatever it is, and I go into that spiral, now I'm thinking like, okay, but I'm not a bad person. God loves me. I need to have the same amount of compassion for myself and the, some minimal dose that God has for me, mm -hmm. right? That, that loving father that so many people didn't have, right? If you think of it as Jesus, we think of it as a noble essence that is God. If God can love me, why can't I love myself? I'm not all light. I'm not all dark. I'm an amalgamation of both. And so much of the human experience and the journey is working through that lower nature, that shadow and finding the light. If we didn't have it, there would be no reason for us to be here. We'd all just vanish. We'd be where yeah. we need to go next. So I share that with you because it's been really helpful for me to not go into the cycle when I feel like a bad person, when I snap at somebody or say the wrong thing or I get in my head and I'm like, wait a second, the shadow part of me, the, the darkness is the part of me that makes me human, that makes me beautiful, that makes me relatable. Because Anthony, if you were perfect, you would not be an interesting actor. <laughs> if you came to this podcast and you didn't share what you just shared about being on the journey and being a baby in it, you wouldn't be relatable. That's the thing that fucking makes us love you, that you got us eating out of your hand. You were wiping your tears away. All of us are like, oh man, if Anthony Ramos is going through that, then I'm okay to go through that. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that with us because you, keeping it a hundred, a thousand, as you said, like keeping it really real is the very thing. That's why we started this podcast. It's the thing that we need more than anything, because as men, we grow up feeling alone.
We feel like we're the only ones experiencing this feeling. That nobody else is experiencing it because everybody else is fucking hiding it, pretending like they got their shit together. So when men like you, who millions of people look up to, are like, hey, this is what I'm experiencing, it makes all of us take a deep breath and relax and take that thing off of our shoulders and be like, oh, maybe I can show up as my full self today mm -hmm. and embrace those shadow parts of me. So I just want to say that I love you, man. So thank you. No, man, I appreciate that, bro. And even the those shadow parts, that's beautiful, Justin. I think that, that metaphor is, is uh, uh, incredible. And even those shadow parts, right? Addictions are solutions, <laughs> right? Mm. It's what you do in order to solve a problem. And when you're a child, that's when those solutions are developed. So shutting down for you wasn't a bad thing. It was an amazing thing that you actually did to survive what you went through. And the fact that you're still doing it is what's bringing you pain. But I think understanding, like not beating yourself up for those behaviors, you know, can like you can want to improve and change and still love those dark parts because those dark parts actually got you through that darkness. And um, yeah, the more we kind of accept those parts and and not just accept, right? love those parts and and you know what i do even sometimes i'll be like i'll be like of of course you're scared or of course you're shutting down of course i kind of just even validate the coping mechanism and that very young part of me that is doing this to help me and i'm like i don't need you to do that now i've got you right mm -hmm. um and, and liz, liz we have the same therapist i think <laughs> <laughs> i think we have the same issues <laughs> yeah. having deep deep radical compassion for the worst worst parts of ourselves and loving those parts even more than the than the parts of ourselves that we love and we want to present to the world it is really a huge part of healing so thank you for sharing all of that i'd like to add this part to it as someone who went a great deal of my life um in destruction towards others and therefore towards myself. We don't want to live with shame. Shame does not help us. So we want to embrace, mm -hmm. like I, I refer to it as like we have uh, Luke Skywalker in us and we have Darth Vader. They're both always living within us. And God created both, our higher nature and our lower nature. So why am I ashamed of a part of me that God in fact created? However, that said, those actions and those things that we can love about ourselves and embrace also can cause destruction towards ourselves and to others. So mm -hmm. we still have to make the distinction of I can love myself and not feel shame and change the behavior. Yeah. Right. And but I think and, what she's saying is when you do love those parts of you, the behavior changes. Exactly. That's, yeah, That's how you I change. Agree. Yeah. I, it's, it's, Which yeah, is counterproductive. Yeah. Just put it to yeah. words. Just put it to words. I, I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> It's a slippery slope though, because I do think a lot of us men have work okay. to do. And, and, and yeah. to then tell a man, not you, Anthony, or you or us, but you know, while we're doing our work, to embrace yourself and, your, and the things, the bad parts of you. Sometimes it's okay to be like, these bad parts, these things that need to be changed, I need to look at and not be proud of. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, no, for sure. And you're not saying that I don't. That's not this what is, it's not what you're saying. I'm just making yeah. sure because I know men listen. And sometimes we can be literal. And I love what you had said earlier. Sorry, Anthony, I'm going on too long. But you were talking about no, your no, dad no. and your relationship with your father and how he was gone in your life and you carried a, a lot of resentment and pain with that. And now in your relationship now, you recognize that he loves you but didn't have the capacity at that time to show up in the way that you needed. Mm -hmm. So you're having empathy and compassion for someone who didn't have the skills and the, and the, and the tools, right, to, uh, to show up in that way. So while we have compassion, we have to have that. And yet also we have to recognize, but how do I change those behaviors? How, if my father has another child, how do I not become my father? If my father had another child today, would he do it differently than he did it with me in that capacity, right? And when so, you have a child, how do you do it differently than your father did? Right. So it's important that we look at those things. And we can't look at them until we are vulnerable and open and honest, which you have demonstrated for us. So um, I'm just echoing what we're I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to balance. But I want to leave Anthony. Uh, one thing you brought up that I think everyone needs to talk about and maybe you guys can talk about is you brought up your pastor. You brought up a friend, right? You brought up somebody who's an accountability partner for you. Yes, sir. This is something yeah. we don't talk 
enough about on this show mm -hmm. that maybe we can dive into, which is I believe that men need the community that so many women um, yeah. uh, emulate. Like we mm -hmm. need to live in community with each other and be able to be vulnerable because I know that there's been times when I've had a full blown panic attack at two in the morning and I called Jamie and if I didn't call Jamie, I would have gone to my behavior. I would have done something, you know, um, and we need people. We need our brothers to see us, to see the shadow parts of ourselves and love those parts so that we can then get out of that behavior. And I love that you were using your pastor as an example and you guys just going through like the mission and you're a baby in this, but men need that. We need accountability partners, right? Iron sharpens iron. Yeah. And so I don't know if you guys want to talk about that for a second, but I just believe that's really important for us men to start to think about reaching out to a friend when you're struggling, reaching out to somebody, having somebody who sees the best in you, who believes in you, who can help you become your better version of yourself. Yeah. One of the biggest things that have been helping me, you know, even, even in when I'm the worst version of myself and when I'm the best version of myself is, is that I, I know that, um, that I, I know, thank God, I know I got people I can call. There is power in using the phone. I've been, practicing more recently there's something to calling somebody and hearing someone's voice on the other end of the phone especially when you feel like you're about to do something you don't want to do or you're going to be somewhere you don't want to be or something like that mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying just picking up the phone and calling someone even if you don't mm -hmm. talk to them about it or if you decide to confess it to them you can't confess it to them openly and and you know it's been working just being able to say those things out loud you know ease that 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 flame that goes on right that that goes on inside right it just kind of it kind of puts a lid on it where you know what i'm saying where i i don't feel that burning desire to to go out and do shit that I probably was doing two weeks ago you know so i'm gonna keep doing it thankfully like you know in my life uh mostly it's with guys they call me to check in like yo you know what's up and they leave a voicemail mm. you know they they're intentional about leaving a voicemail so i can hear their voice so it's not just I called you and I missed mm. the call. It's like, yo, it's Jamel. I da -da 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 -da. Shout out to Jamel. He's been amazing. This dude I met in New York. Incredible mm. artist. You know, my boy Ron. Like just guys being intentional about calling um, and, you know, and, and being like, yo, just, you know, just dropping a line, seeing how you're doing, letting me know what they're doing. Yo, I'm going to be here at one o'clock, two o'clock if you want to pull up. Sometimes you need to actually see somebody and just getting an invitation from somebody can be uh can stop you from doing some shit you don't want to do or can or can swerve you well i'm gonna be checking in with you yeah 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 or everybody can come see me in miami you know what i'm saying we all go to the beach we all do a check-in on the beach you know what i'm saying <laughs> i'm there <laughs> all right i'm gonna i'm gonna go jump in and uh into a and, yeah start to make a movie so good to see you anthony i like uh, just bye, thank Justin. you for sharing yeah, good to see you too, for bro. being so open and vulnerable I, like just jumping in and even just help my heart just feeling yours helped mine. And I can speak for all the men and women that are listening that I'm sure they're going to feel the same way because mm -hmm. I feel seen through you, even though you're talking about your struggles. Mm -hmm. So I have so much respect for you, brother. Love, man. All right, thanks for having me. I'll see you guys. Bye. I'm so happy to see you, bro. I'll see you in a bit. Kill it, man. You know, man, I think what you just spoke to about your, your friends and your boys that have been checking in on you, I think one of the things that we need is groups of friends around us almost like 12 step, which I myself am mm -hmm. part of, right? That keeps me, uh, it keeps me accountable. I know that there are people that would love me and will call me out or call me in, uh, call me on my stuff. And, um, and that's kind of what you spoke about that process, you know, people that just call and check in, make sure we're doing right. You know, that we're not following our behaviors yeah. that keep us where we are. You're two weeks in. The truth is most of the time when you're two weeks in, uh, you'll have two weeks of being great. And then in two weeks from now, you might be back off the track, whatever that means. Yeah. And you might be back in. I don't, you know, I'm not saying predicting what happens just other than generally it takes us a while before we get our sea legs. And, um, yeah. but the, what helps us is the commitment when we bring in friends and those that check on us and remind us of our nobility and why we are really here. And what's interesting is like, if I said to you, Hey man, I need you to put on 20 pounds and put on 10 pounds of muscle for the next Avengers or something of that nature, which starts in six months. You know for sure you put muscle on and, and you do all the stuff because you can see the end right. in the beginning and we commit. But oftentimes yeah. when it comes to like, 
I need to do this for my health or for my, my family. We don't, we don't see it in the same way as we see things that we're trying to attain or try to grasp, you know? So if we start looking at our own spiritual and emotional well-being as, an, as a role for the next Avengers, Jamie, for the next year, you got to do this and do this and treat women with a higher regard. Bring yourself to account each day so that you can be better in the morning. Actually be present with your children. Apologize to your wife. All the stuff that maybe that one can do better. And if I do that at the end of those six months, my health will be better. Man, I love that you brought that up because I think um, I think that speaks to how we can, in fact, be better. Can we talk about those positive actions, right? I, I think a huge part of, of healing and, and recovery is I, I once like I made a list of all of the ways that I cope that are that are not good for me or don't feel good to me or are destructive to myself or others. And then I made a list on the other side of like healthy ways to cope. It's different for everybody, but calling up a friend, going for a walk, making myself drink, you know, a whole glass of water, eating a nice snack, doing yoga, right? Whatever it is for, for you meditating. So, so for men who are listening, who, and I'm sure so many are identifying so closely with what you're going through and the kind of deep work that you're doing right now, what are the positive behaviors that have been helpful for you to replace those less regulated coping mechanisms that you've developed? as a result of your life experience. You know, I think a, a word you said that was good was replace, you know, cause it is, it is good to acknowledge that we, you know, what, a thing that I am learning is that you have to replace it with something. You know, you can't, you can't just be like, yep. oh, I'm gonna cut this out. Stop doing that, yeah. And not fill it in with something. Mm -hmm. You know, that is a little daunting sometimes, but I think, you know, Again, having brothers and you know and sisters who can be like fellowship. How we got have fellowship? How yo we having lunch at this time or like taking time to pray and meditate. You know what I'm saying? Like like really asking yourself. You know what I'm saying? Like you know who's my what's my higher power? What is that? What does that mean to me? You know what I'm saying? Like how do I connect yeah. to that? You know how can I get to a place where I can accept that? You know what? Maybe this life is 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 about something greater than. And it's not just about me. Mm. Yeah, this has been an incredible conversation. Before we go, we, you've talked so much about machismo and uh, how it affects your community. Uh, you know, specifically that the, those ideals of masculinity. And I'm, you know, I'm curious if you can share sort of your, you know, how it how it affected you and how you've healed from that. I mean, it affected me deeply. I think you know, if, you know, you you grow up, especially if you like, if you grow up in the in a home where or in a neighborhood where there's violence and drugs and things like that, and, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, Bushwick was a, a very different place when I was growing up there, Bushwick, Brooklyn, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's still the hood, but it was, that shit was hood when I was growing up there, you know, and, 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 uh, and um, it was just, you, there's like a thing where you can't, you can't seem soft, you can't look soft, like, and this kind of thing you have to put on on the exterior bleeds into your home, right? Because every everybody's feeling like they got to do it outside. So when you get inside, when you get home, your family's behaving this way all day. So now they in, they inside. It's not like they're gonna just come home. Home is not a safe place, right? You know, you're still saying hurtful things to your brother or your sister, or you still you still carrying that that personality that you have to put on as a as a as a shield on the outside you're putting that on in your crib in your in your home so you know so especially for men like there's this thing you know you can't cry don't look soft like you know don't don't talk about your feelings the less you say the better yo i don't talk i just i just punch you in your face i don't talk we just fight you know and it's like yeah. if you was one of those people then you was deemed tough like oh no nah, he don't talk he, he just he just throws the hands like he, he don't say nothing, you know, and, and there's this there's this mentality like I don't talk. I just buck. And it's like, wait, but that's the problem right there. I ain't realized that until I got around people who talk until I didn't realize that. Right. You know, so, I, you know, I'm like, yo, just, you know, and again, remember, I'm, I, my, my whole life was based on staying out of the way, staying out of trouble, trying to find you know, if there was this much space in a in a nook, finding that space so I could just get out or or stay out of the way of whatever was going on over here or whoever was arguing over here, whatever beef was happening over here. 
So, you know, you live in your life in this kind of space, right? It's like, nah, let me just not speak. Let me just be, you know, or let me make somebody laugh and distract them and then I, and I can roll. You know, it was just shit like that, right? Or let me keep myself busy because it'll keep me out of trouble. You know, so these are all things that, you know, that didn't have anything to do with communication, you know? I think the first time I started really learning how to communicate was in theater in high school was when I was getting around all these kids that are mad emotional and they're talking about their feelings that usually when you communicate right away, you don't say what you're feeling because you, you, you need time to compute your feelings. Cause sometimes it, sometimes people want to get, get it out of you right away. And you're like, yo, like I never been able to communicate that way. I actually need a second to process what I'm feeling. You know, I actually don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't allow your anxiety to make me say something before I'm ready to say it, you know, and vice versa. Don't allow my anxiety to try to pry some shit out of somebody that, you know, that was a big problem I had. That is a big problem I have. I'm gonna say is right now yeah. that I'm working on. It's mm -hmm. like, yo, if somebody says they need time or they can't give you the answer you want right away, it's fine. Don't try to get it out of them. Just give them some space. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And if mm -hmm. and then vice versa, if somebody want to throw you the flood with the big ass long paragraph of a 18 paragraph text message, don't feel pressured that you need to answer that shit right away. You don't have to answer right away. You know what I'm saying? You answer it when you feel like you're ready to say the most respectful, thoughtful, like empathetic, humble thing you probably could say, you know, because in the moment, and I probably just might, yo, fuck you, man. Get out of here. Or get, get out of here with these 18 paragraphs. I don't want to talk to you no more. But that's not what you're feeling deep, deep mm. inside. That's the surface feeling. Wonderful. I love it, man. You know, every episode we do is different. This is one that I think is so powerful and important because you are someone in the midst acknowledging like when you say something like I'm two weeks in, most of the time we talk to people who somewhat have arrived. Think they've arrived. Yeah, exactly right. Most people are in the process, are two weeks in or two weeks out. So this one's really important because you, with your uh, prestige and your art, and your respect and your regard, but also your humanity, your your uh, apparent, I don't want to call it brokenness, but I do call my own part, you know, there's some parts of me that are broken that I can repair. The fact that you're willing to talk about that and it doesn't devalue your worth, your ability to work and to be a present man in the world, but you still are recognizing that there's ways to be better. I'm pulling for you, man, more than I was before. And the next time my wife is watching well, I watch it too, to maybe straight. But when next time my wife is like this, I'm gonna be like, baby, sit closer. That's a man right there. To, to, that's a man right there that, that I hope yeah. my son can can watch and learn from to see yeah. like, wow, you're on this journey, man. You 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 it's mm -hmm. life is wonderful and all these things. And yet there's mm -hmm. always refinement and work. And uh so I appreciate yeah. that you really, really a lot, man. And I'm gonna, in fact, I'm gonna talk to Justin. I'm gonna have us all get on a text thread. Because uh, I'm going to be one of those dudes that's going to reach out to you and remind you of your nobility. Not only your brilliance, but your nobility. And uh, and to remember what you're doing. So when those two weeks go by mm -hmm. and then you forget for a minute and you get distracted, mm -hmm. that you have enough, te enough text messages to remind you to find your way back to the point that you're trying to mm -hmm. get, you know, to see the end in the beginning and to work towards that. All right. With that, give me a uh, sound bite of what mm -hmm. you think it means to be man enough. What does it mean to be man enough? Intentional about going against what the world says it is to be a man. You know, humility, grace, empathy, and um, and vulnerability. Yeah, man, I I love it. I I would also add that I think being man enough is doing what you're doing right today. Yeah, I agree. This whole interview. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. what we do when, we, when we're vulnerable. Yeah. We reflect and then we feel exposed. And then yes. the first thing we want to do is yeah. cover up and go like, uh oh, right. uh oh, I show too right. much. But I'll say this as someone that has walked through the world more recently naked, like takes no posture in no more, be authentic. Yeah. I've had more, and we don't do it for this reason, yeah. but I have, have had more love and respect than I had when I was posturing. Mm. Um, I've been able to touch and help people because I was able to say stuff that uh, was very embarrassing or vulnerable. And I thought it was going to be something that was nothing but love. So there'll be two people that'll be like, I can't believe he said that. Everybody else will be like, oh man, thank God he said that. And how brave is he? So 
Uh, mm-hmm. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a pleasure, man. Yeah. We're gonna have you. We're gonna have you back. And we'll keep going. And can I be, yeah. can I join the group text? Can I be part of it, or, or is it a bro group? group you group always text? can join the text, but I, but <laughs> but also speaking of men having men that you don't, because this is one thing we do when there's a woman present, we posture a little bit differently, yeah. right? Because yeah, I want yeah, yeah. I want to be I want to be desired or seen or whatever it is. So there's a little bit different something sometimes when when men get together and don't have to worry about. Yeah. You're welcome to the group, Liz, but also. <laughs> You'll have a separate one without me. <laughs> You're welcome to the group, but we have a breakout group, too. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> we won't talk about you. <laughs> We're going to have a breakout. That's well, dope. I'm honored. Um, and uh, yeah, again, thank you so much. I, I feel like we, we I, I hung on every word. It was, it's been an honor, man. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate y'all. And uh, thank you for Thank you for this time, for real. All right. So for those of you listening um, to our amazing, wonderful conversation we've had with Anthony Ramos, um, we're going to be back next week. Tune in. <laughs> hey, Liz, real quick, where can they find us? enough slash podcast. <laughs> and they can listen to us where? Uh, on, on Spotify, on the, your podcast app, on your uh, iPhone or mm-hmm. other phone. And uh, Stitcher, YouTube. We're on YouTube. Oh, we're on YouTube. You can watch us. You can watch listen. this. Until next time, uh, it's been a pleasure. We are Justin Baldoni. On his behalf, I'm Jamie Heath. I'm Liz Plank. And this is Banana. Banana.